Chapter 17 have done with fear. Fear, fear was front page news 4,000 years ago. It was in the headlines when Noah launched the ark. It appears 401 times in the Bible. It has predominated through every war, and when there is no war, we are still afraid of something or somebody. <coughs> it is fateful, it is fatal for any magician to have fear. If you are afraid, you cannot work magic. The two are foreign to each other. Fear is negative and therefore unworkable. Some know the meaning of claustrophobia, fear of confined spaces. They cannot phone from a public booth. They cannot ride for long in small cars. They cannot sit in a non-corridor train, the middle row or in a cinema, or even in a room unless the door is open. If this applies to you, you would give the earth to know how to overcome it. Agoraphobia is the opposite. It's a fear of open spaces. If you have to cross the road, you are sure you will get knocked down or collapse when you are halfway over. You are terrified of being out alone where space is all around you. What can you do about it? You shrink and cower, expecting something unknown to strike you. You don't think there is anything that can cure you of this fear. Aelorophobia, the fear of cats, strikes panic in you, although you are fond of animals. Field Marshal Lord Roberts, V.C., couldn't even bear to look at pictures of cats, much less have one near him. Another terror, Astraophobia, fear of strong winds. You must stay indoors when there is a gale. You dare not venture out. You are afraid the wind will choke you, or boil you over, or that trees and things will fall on you. Hematophobia, the fear of blood, is a dreadful thing, for even a pinprick that draws a spot of blood makes you feel faint. Butcher shops are torture chambers to you, because the sight of blood is too much. You can't stand it. Have you ever leaned out of a third floor window and looked below, climbed a hill and looked down? You can't do it. This mysterious horror is acrophobia, fear of heights. They seem to draw you. It affects some people very deeply. They dare not stand on a chair because they become really ill. Hydrophobia, the fear of water, means that you are unable to enjoy a sea view, for the water seems to call to you. You have to keep away. Fear of the dark, called nyctophobia, makes you turn around every few minutes at night because you feel someone is behind you. Perhaps you are afraid of crowds, of being alone, of leaving the house, of meeting people. Whichever form of fear takes, it sits on your shoulder like a bird of prey and holds you back from magic. You want to run away, but your legs are like lead. You panic, your heart beats wildly. You perspire. You cannot battle against fear. Your constant battle against fear is exhausting. You have been reading this book and thought you could work magic, but now you feel you can't. You hadn't thought about fear. You had not reckoned to contend with that. Your conflicting emotions give rise to muzziness. Clear thinking is impossible. All of a sudden you feel unreal. You might have mastered all I've said, but you can't see how you can get rid of fear, not even by magic. What is the solution? First, realize that your feeling of fear is your heaviest burden. Talk to your subconscious. Listen to your subconscious. You will probably hear something like this. What you are most afraid of won't happen. Or... All your fears are unfounded. Act on it. Take your courage from it. Put fear out of your mind. Be positive. You want to work magic, and you can work magic, if you determine to have done with fear. How can you best get rid of being afraid? By belief. The famous quote, There is nothing to fear except fear itself. 
believe in your subconscious. As I told you previously, your subconscious knows everything. Past, present and future. Yes, everything. You are tapped into the universal internet wirelessly, as George Nury puts it in Coast to Coast AM Radio. Your subconscious protects you, warns you of impending danger, guides you the way you should go. You have a premonition. That comes from your subconscious. I told you that I once had a premonition not to accept a lift home from theatre in a friend's car. I acted on it and saved myself from being in a terrible crash. I had a feeling, an impression, a hunch, call it what you like, and this came from my subconscious who was warning me. You will get a feeling, a strong impression, if you regularly talk and listen to your subconscious. Like this you will be warned and guided, you will be protected, everybody gets warnings, but few recognize them, as they are not aware of their subconscious and the wonderful mental radio within their own minds. I'll read that again. Everybody gets warnings, but few recognize them, as they are not aware of their own subconscious and the wonderful mental radio within their own minds. And only through silence, stillness and solitude can you still the constant chatter of your own mind so much that you can pick up on these vibrations, like your best friend was talking to you sitting next to you, but it takes a long time. Well worth it though. You must be aware of the power your subconscious and not be asleep at the switch. Like this you become guarded and protected. There is no need to fear anything when you have this knowledge. You need never be afraid of thunderstorms. Need not feel terror when it lightens. Your subconscious can warn you long before the approach of a storm. If you should stay where you are or flee elsewhere you think this impossible? Listen, in the silence, stillness and solitude, and even then, true, different for different people, but possibly years of practice, you can hear your subconscious in the middle of your everyday normal routine, like a muscle that has worked in the gym gets stronger and stronger by use. A large number of birds made their daily roost at the top of a big tree. You could always see them congregated there. But one particular day they were not to be seen. They did not sit on top of the tree as was their usual habit. The tree was stuck by lightning. The birds knew it was going to be struck. They knew they had to not go to that tree as usual. Nature is full of the examples. In the big... Tsunami in Indonesia, I believe. All the animals fled to high ground hours before the tsunami struck and killed. Is it 250,000 people? The animals are tuned in. And in like manner, we are not left high and dry. We get premonitions. Like the birds, we must act. We are all warned. The thing is to be aware. Ken Lawton, who is a brilliant dancer, a fine singer, and an accomplished actor, who has appeared in a dozen or so West End shows, including Annie Get Your Gun, Love From Judy, and Irma La Douche, was certainly warned. He was travelling from London up north, and was just in time to catch his train. It was important that he caught that train, as he had to be on time for the show, but he had a feeling that he mustn't go on it, and he acted upon this impression. There was a terrible rail crash and very many people on that train were killed. Horatio Nelson, the greatest sailor since our world began, Tennyson's words, not mine, had great awareness and always knew what was going to happen. It started when he was in his teens. He had fits of depression and said he wished himself overboard. Southey, in, he, in his Life of Nelson, comments on this depression. Quote, the state of mind in which these feelings began is what the mystics mean by their season of darkness and desertion, unquote. or the dark night as the soul, as St. Teresa of Avila mentioned. Several years later, when he was a captain commanding HMS Albarn, 
off the coast of America, his subconscious mind knew, and he acted on it. He had just captured a fishing schooner owned and commanded by Master Nathaniel Carver, homeward bound for Boston. By the rules of war, the schooner was now Nelson's prize, to bring him much-needed prize money with which to help support an aged father and several young brothers and sisters. But, acting on this strange inward prompting, he threw this to the winds of destiny. Sending for Carver, he ordered him to pilot board vessels into Boston's Bay. This done, Nelson restored the schooner and her cargo to the speechless master, giving him a certificate to prevent his capture by any other British ship. Then came swift karma. Nelson and his crew, weakened by battling against strong gales and salt food, fell victims to a dreadl dreaded and often fatal disease. Nelson decided to land his worst victims at Quebec for treatment. Suddenly, through the mist, a sail was seen approaching them. They were hailed, and alongside came the fishing schooner with Master Natalia Carver at her wheel. In the thick of the most deplorable war, he had risked his life and ship to bring Nelson presents of fresh fruit, vegetables and poultry. These gifts, coming at the moment when they did, saved the lives of Nelson and his crew, and all this because Nelson acted upon his feelings. Did his subconscious warn him of impending illness? Did his subconscious persuade him to give away the schooner, in order that it may come to his rescue? You can look at it how you like, but it appears to be so, doesn't it? And then again, seated with his officers at dinner, whilst cruising off the mouth of the Nile, word was brought to the cabin that the French fleet had been sighted in Aberkirk Bay, just ahead of them. Without asking their strength or disposition, Nelson calmly remarked, By this time tomorrow I shall have gained a peerage or Westminster Abbey. In due course he was raised to the peerage as Baron Nelson of the Nile and of Borham Thorpe. Again his feeling proved right. Again an old Nile friend of the Admiral, Captain the Honourable Henry Blackwood, arrived at Nelson Surrey's home early in September. He found Nelson already up and dressed and strolling in the garden, although it was only five in the morning. Nelson walked eagerly up to him as he drove in. He said, I'm sure you bring me news of the French and Spanish fleets. I'm sure I have yet to beat them. How did he know? He was ashore on sick leave and his squadron at sea. There was no radios and televisions. It came from his own mind. He was warned. Always his feelings proved correct. Depend upon it, Blackwood, said Nelson. I shall yet give Monsieur Villeneuve a drubbing, and again it proved true. After accepting the command from the First Lord, Nelson acted on another impression. Leaving the Admiralty, he went straight to his upholsters where was stored the coffin, made from mainmast of L'Orient, flagship of the French at the Nile, and given him as a grim memento of that action. He requested his upholsterer to take out the storage of the coffin and have a history engraved upon it, saying that he would most probably require it on his return. In due course he put to sea in his beloved flagship Victory and rejoined his squadron cruising off Cadiz. And although the enemy's ships could not be seen there, could be seen there, each preparing for sea, Nelson's feelings told him that the time for action was not yet. Some of his ships needed stores, and were sent to Gibraltar for that purpose. But one captain feared he would miss the battle. Nelson smiled confidently and said, There'll be plenty of time for you to go to Gibraltar and return. And he was right again. An excited group of midshipmen on the Victory's quarter-deck were eagerly discussing the chances of battle and promotion. They had overhead heard the Admiral talking with Captain Hardy who expressed his wonder if the enemy put to sea that day. Nelson, Next morning the opposing fleets were sailing firmly towards each other. The seamen stowed away pictures and furniture in the admiral's cabin and glanced at one another. 
On his desk lay discarded his fighting sword, comrade of all his former actions. For the first time in his career, Nelson had gone into the battle without his sword. What did it mean? Blackwood had taken his hand and said he hoped to return after the battle and find him in possession of twenty prizes. Nelson shook his head. God bless you, Blackwood. I shall never speak to you again. Blackwood returned later to find his admiral already speechless, sinking into a coma. Nelson had known. And he had been right again. Doesn't it go to show that your mind is truly wonderful, that you can rely upon your subconscious to tell you things, true things, never untruths, is proved again and again. Why are you afraid of gales, water, open spaces, confined spaces, and all the rest of it? Simply because of what might happen? Yet if anything awful was going to happen to you, you would be warned. All you've got to do is practice meditation, quietly, listening in, so that you can cultivate that certain feeling which you get when trouble is on the map. The more you meditate, the more you do, do you become able to feel things. By meditation you can train yourself to reach the fourth and fifth dimensions, the dimensions that cut out fear and give you calm. That inner security of eternity. It was Job who said, the thing I feared has come upon me. Of course it does, because you attracted it. You vibrated it out in one vibration of fear or another and attracted it. Fear is out of focus thought. Who says so? That brilliant psychologist Gilbert Oakley. In his vital psychology book, How to Cultivate Confidence and Promote Personality, he says in it, I fear nothing. Least of all do I fear being afraid. I know there is no such thing as fear. I know there is reasonable sense of precaution, care and common sense. I see everything in its correct perspective and right proportion. This being so, I have no need of fear. When you lack confidence, you are fearful. It is self-confidence that you want. I have thought about fear in all its most awful moments, and it has struck me that a man who could be calm in a terrible earthquake must surely have learned something. So I read all about it. Seshu Hayaokawa, who played Colonel Saito in the bridge on the river Kai, tells the story. In his wonderful autobiography, Zen showed me the way. Here is an extract. Some years ago, a European college professor visiting in Japan was walking with some Japanese on the fifth floor of a hotel in Tokyo. Suddenly they all heard a rumbling. There was a gentle heaving under our feet, the European later noted. The swaying and creaking and the crash of objects became more and more pronounced. Alarm and excitement mounted. The terror was all the greater because the great Japanese earthquakes of 1923 were still fresh in memory. People rushed out of the room into the corridor to the stairs. Professor Eugene Herigel, the European professor, asked the Japanese gentleman with whom he had been talking why he didn't hurry to run for safety. I noticed to my astonishment, the professor said, that he was sitting there unmoved, hands folded, eyes nearly closed, as though none of it concerned him. The Japanese, who had remained so unperturbed, was a Zen Buddhist. He had put himself into a state of extreme concentration and thus became unassailable. Why do I tell you this from what is one of the very finest books you could read? Because the philosophy of Buddhism is the nearest thing I know to psychology. A psychologist who studies Buddhism sees the likeness at once. As Seshu so truly says, In this day of fear, fear of the atomic and nuclear blast, radiation poisoning, Annihilation war, riots, we greatly need the ability to become individually unassailable. Seshu Hayakawa is out to perfect his own mind. It is not time, is it not time that we perfected our own minds? We can fear our, our, free our minds of fear and put it in its place, perfect tranquility. We can free our minds of fear and put in its place perfect tranquility. We can make ourselves unassailable. 
When we reach the fourth dimension of mind, we can be unassailable. We would not feel fear. You will have noticed that the Japanese who had remained so unperturbed put himself in a state of extreme concentration. Concentrate upon the fourth dimension and so raise your mind. You will know no fear. A newspaper heading said, So bombs or no bombs, the Queen is going to Ghana. The Queen never shows a trace of panic. She is an extremely cool and courageous person. She smiles her way through the densest crowd with never a thought of fear, of some, fan of some fanatic throwing a bomb. Calm, courage and confidence, these are the lessons she teaches us. Think about it, enlightenment will come. The mind can see an event years and even centuries in the future. It can see an event only a few hours ahead, by acting on your premonitions or feeling. Though you do not know why or you should do so, it will be revealed soon. Most people are afraid of something, be it an anxiety over an ailing child, fear of losing someone's love, or of being left alone and unwanted. Fears that chill you, fears of sickness, old age, poverty, this is a terrible frame of mind to get into. Rise triumphant over your baser self. Your thoughts can be unforeseen obstacles in everything you do. You can be your own worst enemy. They can be so powerful at times that they can set in motion the very thing you fear, which accounts for the old saying that if you dread a thing, it happens. Your life begins to go wrong from the moment you fear it will do so. Your own anxiety causes an attitude which impels the thing you fear to happen. Carlyle said, The first duty of a man is that of subduing fear. He must get rid of fear. He cannot act at all till, de till then. His acts are slavish and not true. You must get rid of fear, as Carlyle so truly says, to be told that something frightened us in our childhood, and that is why we are frightened now, is no consolation. It may be the cause of our fear, this childhood memory, but that which we are much concerned with is how to get rid of this awful feeling of being afraid. Many different energy technologies, techniques exist today, 2015. EFT is one, emotional freedom technique and tapping. Lee Beamer's tapping protocol is another. The aimprogram.com is another. And many, many more of us off the top of my head. So you have no excuse. All freely available online. You can do it through the training of your subconscious. Through being so in tune with that you can recognize the warnings giving are the message that brings courage. You can overcome fear like the pilots do. When they crash, they quickly go up into an airplane again, because if they didn't, they know they would never fly again. If you are afraid of the dark, you must go out into the dark as often as you can and face up to it. The fear will go. You cannot run away from what you fear. That only makes you more afraid. You must face it. I repeat, face it. There are incidents where gamblers who are losing heavily and fear that they will lose the lot get up from the chair and draw a white chalk circle round it. This, they feel, protects them from evil and the chances are they will start to win. But a white circle drawn around a man can hardly protect him from any harm physically or mentally. The practice is just a psychological make-up to give confidence. It has no magic significance whatsoever. Practices such as this will only yoke a man to harmful beliefs. We should meditate more and grow into a state of inner tranquility if we would discard fears and limitations. To prove that you can work magic you must show that you are not afraid. You have thought yourself into that fear with your mind. Run yourself out with your legs. You are ready to take your first dive, poised on the plank, leaning forward. You hesitate. Fear takes a hold of you. You try again and again. In the end you plunge with a terrific flop. Because somebody had laughed at you and you couldn't bear it, so you dived rather awkwardly, but you made the attempt at last. Again and again you must plunge into the very thing that makes you afraid, and in the end you will have killed fear forever. Use your fear as a means of conquest. 
Very often a fear is due to using your mind more than your body. There should be balance. You generate fears if you think too much and neglect action. Lead a more active life. Exercise in the open. Go for long walks. An overactive mind and an underactive body can only bring trouble. Take the longest walk you've ever taken and take this book with you. Whilst you are reading, open it haphazard and read a few inspiring words. Then take the long walk home. Like that you have balance, the mind and body working in harmony. It is when you get too much of one thing and not enough of the other that you begin to run off the rails. To prove that you can work magic you must show that you are not afraid. You have thought yourself into that fear with your mind. Run yourself out of it with your legs. Very often a fear is due to your mind more than your body. Have I had fears? Yes, many of them. I have done a lot of parachuting, but being shot down twice over enemy territory was not so funny. But as I said before, when I was a nervous wreck in hospital for nine months, I overcame my illness and my fears completely. Through the study of psychology, the pile of books on my bed changed my life, and I hope this book will happily change yours. The Art of Magic is Transformation.